Hey everybody, my name is the XSS Rat, and today I'll be talking about actual cross-site scripting, the thing that's in my name. Uh, I found a few vectors um, in extraordinary places, um, and I want to talk to you guys about, first of all, the way I find these attack methods, these attack vectors, and second of all, how you can evade filters, because a huge problem I come across is um, a lot of web apps these days are better aware of what can happen when you don't sanitize your input properly. So they put in these filters in place. But the problem a lot of these filters have is that they're blacklist based. So they'll take a certain character, for example, if you enter the word script in there, they will filter out the word script and leave the rest. Now that, that gives some challenges, but it can also help us. Because for example, if uh, if the filter filters out the word script, maybe we can put the word script somewhere like a tag and make the cross-site scripting a tag vector. Uh, we can open our tag, we can put the word script in there and we can close our tag. But we know that the web filter will throw away the script tag, so it will only leave the uh, open and closing tag. So what we can do is put script in there and maybe in the middle of there put like an S and then put script again and then uh, close our tag so we will have something like opening tag s script ripped closing tag this will mean that the web server will probably filter out the second part uh, and not the first one so it will probably filter out the script part uh, but if it's a bad filter it will only filter once so it will remove the script part leaving us with a script tag um, that's a way to evade filters. Now there are a lot of ways to evade filters, um, also a lot of filters out there, so it'll depend on your situation. But if you want to know more, Port Swigger, the guys who uh, developed Burp Pro, those guys are also, uh, they brought out a good list for filter evasion for cross-site scripting. So I'll include that one in the description as well. Now the main topic, topic I really want to talk about today is finding your attack factors for cross-site scripting. So I'll go over my methodology first. What I do for cross-site scripting uh, is I'll find I'll start by using the application like any regular user would. I'll make an account, I'll see what I can do, I'll try all the functions, and then I'll make a new account. And on that, on that new account, I'll start by adding the name as a cross-site scripting attack factor. Everything I can, I'll fill in as a cross-site scripting attack factor. Because what happens often is you see secondary XSS attacks. Now, um, when you enter a cross-site scripting attack and it shows in the same module, uh, that's what I call a primary cross-site scripting attack. It'll be like you um, you attack your target on the first uh, instance that you can see. So there are also instances where, for example, a blind cross-site scripting attack will be needed. So you'll insert a cross-site uh, scripting attack factor uh, and you won't be able to execute it uh, yourself. Another account with higher priorities, with higher authorization um, will have to execute it for example in a different module. I'm going to give you guys an example because this can be quite confusing. Say for example I have an employee and an administrator and the employee can enter timesheets and the administrator he can uh, look at the invoices and create invoices based on timesheets, etc. So you enter a cross-site scripting attack as the employee in your timesheet. You won't see it because the timesheet is properly sanitized. Uh, in the timesheets, nobody will be able to see it. Now along comes the administrator and he'll start making uh, an invoice for that timesheet. Uh, when he makes that invoice, He'll get all the items from the timesheet, and on the timesheet there's an XSS vector. Uh, but the developers forgot to sanitize the input on the uh, invoice screen. So you'll notice that the attack gets triggered there. It's in a different module, it's from a different user. There's no way the same user can enter this. Um, this is what, the, what I call a secondary cross-site scripting attack. I don't know if this is actually a thing, in, in, if you can Google this term. Um, but it's what I use a lot. Now, one thing I also want to discuss is uh, the front-end UI. They often filter out your, your input in there already. So, for example, say you have a name and you enter an opening tag in there. 
you can't have an opening tag in your name in most places. So uh, people will usually filter that out. As a developer, I filter out every strange character that's in the name. Only alphanumeric characters belong in the name. But what you can do is directly call the API call that is being called. So for example, if I create an account, I can open my developer console in Chrome or I can put a proxy between my browser and between the target um, and I can capture the traffic there. So I can see what requests are being made and I can capture those requests and edit them. So uh, for example, if I send in my username and my uh, name and my uh, last name, first name, all my details, I send them, I can capture them with my with my uh, web proxy, like for example Burp, and I can edit it to insert my cross-site scripting attack vector in there. That way I will bypass all the JavaScript validation because front-site validation will usually happen uh, by JavaScript. Now, uh, when you enter it that way, it won't always get accepted, but there is a chance that it will get accepted. Um, Another thing I can think about is uh, passing between two programs. So say you have a target that has two applications in scope. One is um, an application to make invoices and the other application is to view the invoices. You will have to make sure that you check both applications because one thing you often see is that there are teams working on different components. One of those components will be the creation of the invoice and the other will be the displaying of the invoice because they're on different programs. So often you'll have two different teams working together on them. And you'll notice that there are integrations between these two programs. So when the creation of the invoice gets done and uh, a user um, reads the invoice, they both have to read from the same database and write to it. Otherwise that won't work. So that means that when the input does not get sanitized properly, uh, into the, and it gets put into the database. So for example, in the creation of the invoice, uh, you can get the details of the invoice, but the developers chose to sanitize the front end input. So for example, it gets the data from the database and it will sanitize it then and there. So it won't sanitize it when it puts it into the database, only when it reads it out. This means that the program to view the invoices will also read it from the database, but if that program forgets to sanitize the output, uh, the input, uh, excuse me, that means that the cross-site scripting will just happen. Uh, now, oftentimes, and this is the last topic I want to talk about in this video, cross-site scripting, there are different things you can do with cross-site scripting. Uh, one of the things I read about a lot is account takeover. So you steal the cookie, the session cookie, for example, and you insert that session cookie into your own browser. Then you can take over the account. But that rarely happens these days because a lot of people know about the HTTP only flag. That is a flag you can set on your cookie that will stop you from stealing it from JavaScript. It will basically stop JavaScript from reading the cookie. That doesn't mean that all is lost though, because as a hacker, what often happens is the cookie is set on the base path. So if you inspect your cookies, on the path you will see a slash. Now the web app is usually built on a different path. So you will go to www.domain.com slash web app, for example. And when the session cookie is set on the slash domain, that means that the session cookie is uh, is set on that domain and is read on, read on all subdomains. But it also means that I can insert my own cookie on the web app subdomain. So instead of reading the cookies, I will insert my own cookie, making him the user that is using that account on that computer that is executing my cross-site scripting attack. That will be me. So for example, if somebody is ordering something somewhere and I insert my session cookie into their browser, I'm able to get that order delivered to me because I would be the one ordering it. Um, that's one of the things you can do to make your cross-site scripting attacks worse. Uh, there are a couple of other things. Uh, one of the things is reading the data from the web page. So for example, if a token is displayed in the web page, you can steal that token and pretend to be a user. Um, if the cross-site scripting happens on a GDPR or a PIL uh, sensitive page, 
you can make sure that those uh, that those records are properly uh, uh, sanitized. So, for example, if I can insert a cross-site scripting vector into an invoice, but I cannot read that invoice, and I can read the data through the cross-site scripting attack, and I can send it back to me, that would be uh, also good because I can read data that I'm not able to read in a normal way. That's also pretty bad for the company. So severity goes up again. Now another thing I've read is cross uh, content security policy. Um, Cross-site scripting attacks. When I steal data from a page, I have to send it somewhere. Now content security policy stops me from sending it to my own server because it stops outgoing connections and that kind of stuff. But there are things I can do. For example, I can uh, CSRF, you, all, you guys probably all know what that means, cross-site request forgery. If there is not a token defined, I can insert uh, an item uh, from that user into my account. For example, I can create an invoice that contains all of the data that I want to see. I can, for example, copy that invoice and put it on my account uh, as that user. Um, there are things you can do with cross-site scripting um, that, that uh, don't involve uh, cookies and data, but they are very limited. Um, you can do object insertion. It's kind of like cross-site scripting where you try to break a web page, or for example, if uh, content gets read, uh, from uh, an input field and gets put directly into an email. That's also bad because you can break the emails HTML code and you can insert your own HTML code in there which would make your own email which would make it so that you can mail anything you want to go to your client. Now I know that's not strictly cross-site scripting, that's object insertion. But I did not want to make another video on object insertion. That's not really my strong point. Thank you all for listening. See you in the next video.